So today, let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever missed a moment? Have you ever, in the course of your life, maybe you're five, maybe you're 50, maybe you're 105, uh, if you look back on the history of your life, have you ever missed an important moment? Anybody? Raise your hand. Okay, yeah, me too. Missed some important moments in my life. When I was in college, like most college students, I liked athletics. I liked going to the college games. And I remember one football game in particular my freshman year in college that I went to, but I, I had to leave at halftime because I had to have a J-O-B, a job in college. And for whatever reason, I, I had to leave at halftime to go to my job that day. And uh, I remember leaving the game thinking, there's no way we're going to win. We were behind by a bunch of touchdowns, several, three or four, I think. And I thought, man, there's no way we're coming back. We just had it handed to us the whole first half. And to my surprise, when I got back to the dorm later that night, guess what had happened? We won. We won. In dramatic fashion, right at the end of the game, we came back in the second half, and right at the end of the game, we scored and went up by two or three points and just barely squeaked it out. The whole campus was talking about it. The whole campus got to experience it, but not me. I missed the moment. And even for weeks after that, people would be talking about it in the dorm, and, 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 and I wasn't there. I missed it. There's other moments in my life I, I missed. Um, I remember in, in March of 1999, I, I was again in college, and I was at work at my J-O-B, and a friend came up to me, and he said, hey, how much money do you have? And, and I was in college, I didn't have a lot of money, but I did have a job, and so I did have some money. And, and, and I said, I, I, you know, I don't know, I think it was about 4,500 bucks, I told him whatever I had, and, he said, man, I've got a great feeling about this new company. I think, you, I think you ought to invest in it. I just bought some shares in it. I think it's going to be big. It's going to blow up. It'll really pay off. He said, you, you ought to take that, that $4,000, $4,500, and you ought to put it all in this company. And I went and I looked it up, and the company was, was trading its shares for $3.80 a share at the time. So I could have bought 1,000 or a little over 1,000 shares of it. And it would have paid off big because that company was called Amazon. <laughs> um, I missed the moment because you know how many shares I bought? Zero. I didn't do it, just like you. Didn't do it. I remember Easter of 2011. My brother-in-law, love the guy, he came up to me with a crazy idea. Easter of 2011. We talked for about two hours at Easter about this. He told me about this new thing called Bitcoin, cryptocurrency. I had never heard of it. It was the first time I'd ever heard of it. I remembered getting my phone out and Googling it. I mean, this was a brand new concept to me in 2011. And he was telling me all about it and how it was the wave of the future and blockchain technology and this is how finance is going to be done and this is going to be a, a big deal. And we, we talked about it, and it was intriguing for me. I like new things. I like technology. And I, and I thought to myself, I thought, you know, this is the kind of thing that could be a big thing at some point. Um, it could be revolutionary. And I went, and I talked to Abby, and we prayed a little bit about it. We looked at our bank account, and we decided we had about $2,500 we could just try on it if we wanted to. And so back then, though, like Bitcoin was hard to buy. You, you couldn't just go on and, and buy it like you can today. Today, you can just trade it like a stock on most major platforms. It's super easy. But back then, there were only like two or three of these digital wallets, and you had to sign up for one, and then you had to get approved, and then you had to get into a different portal with a different company. And I tried for two weeks to figure out how to buy this stuff. And, and I just never could figure it out. I never could get all the pieces to come together. Back then, Bitcoin was trading at 86 cents a coin. 86 cents a coin. I never was able to figure it out, and after a couple of weeks, I got busy and got on to other things and just kind of forgot all about it after some time went by. The deal seemed kind of shady anyway, and I thought, well, it probably won't be anything like so many other deals are. You know, in 2013, Bitcoin passed $1,000 a coin or a share for the first time. At its height, 
at the, at the peak of where it got to, it was over $50,000 a coin for a little while, if I remember right. And I went back and did some sixth grade multiplication this week. If I would have bought $2,500 worth of Bitcoin back in 2011 when my brother-in-law and I first talked about it, today or this week, it would have been worth $57.5 million. Uh-huh. Missed the moment. <laughs> At its peak, if I could have just timed it right, if I wouldn't have sold any of it and I would have sold out right when it got to its peak, it would have been worth over $120 million dollars. I missed the moment. I missed the moment. That would have changed a lot in my life. Um, would have changed a lot in the life of this church. Wouldn't have taken us near as long to build these buildings we're working on. I'll tell you that. But uh, yeah, missed the moment. I guess the point I'm trying to make is we all miss the moment. You probably have stories similar to that or akin to that along your journey in life. We miss moments in our marriages. We miss moments in our kids' lives for one reason or another. We, we can miss the moment in financial situations, as I've just illustrated. We can miss the moment in our careers, at our jobs. If you've never missed a moment, then you're certainly the exception, not the rule. Because moments get missed all the time, and there are consequences for missing the moment. In our text today, we're going to see an encounter that Jesus has with a man by the name of Thomas. This encounter happens with other people in the room, but it's really a one-on-one -on -one encounter between Jesus and Thomas. It's a one-at-a-time moment. The thing that makes this unique from all the other passages we've studied in this series is this. All the others happened before Jesus died on the cross. This encounter with Thomas happens after the resurrection. Jesus dies on the cross. He's put in the tomb. He, he's, he, he rises three days later. And then he comes back and he appears to his disciples. It's a post-resurrection encounter. It's a powerful, powerful lesson in missing the moment. The text centers around Thomas, and Thomas had missed the moment. You see, after Jesus was resurrected from the dead and he began to make his appearances to people, he came and he, he visited with the disciples, but Thomas wasn't there. Thomas missed that moment. Luke records it like this in his gospel, and I want to read it from Luke's gospel, and then we're going to go to John's gospel and spend most of our time there. But I want you to see this point that we need to see before we move on. In Luke 24, 36 through 39, it says, As they were saying these things, he himself, Jesus, he stood in their midst, there in the room, and he said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled, they were terrified, and they thought they were seeing a ghost. And Jesus says to them in verse 38, he says, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet that it is I myself. Touch me and see, because a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you can see, I have. Thomas missed that moment right there. That's a big moment to miss, if you're asking me. I mean, that, that's a big one. If you go over to John chapter 20, verse 24, we see the encounter with Thomas. And this is the text that gets Thomas labeled as doubting Thomas, have you ever heard of him being the doubter? Have you ever heard of doubting Thomas? Here's where we get it from. John 20, verses 24 through 29. But Thomas, called twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. He missed it. So the other disciples were telling him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, if I don't see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger into the mark of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will never believe. A week later, his disciples were indoors again, and Thomas was with them this time. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and look at my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Don't be faithless, but believe and Thomas responded to him, My Lord and my God. 
Jesus said, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. The point I want to make here at the onset is this. Thomas isn't the only doubter in the room. He's the only doubter in the second encounter a week later, but in Luke's gospel, he makes it a point to tell us about that first encounter that they all doubted. Thomas wasn't the only disciple to struggle with his belief that Jesus Christ had risen from the dead. After all, that's a hard thing to believe. You can see why someone would have trouble with that concept. But in Luke's account, Jesus says to all of those who were there at the first encounter, he says, why do doubts arise in your hearts? And then he tells them, come take a look at my hands and my feet. It's me. Touch me and see. You see, when when Thomas says in John's gospel that he will not believe unless he himself touches the flesh, touches the wounds himself, he's reacting to what the other disciples who were there in the moment had told him. They had gotten to touch it, and he's saying, I want to touch it too. Yeah, I'll believe it if I can touch it too, but I don't believe you guys. I mean, he thought they were just telling him a big story, and he just wasn't going to believe it. But the truth is, they all doubted. They all struggled. They thought it was a ghost in the first encounter. Thomas wasn't the only doubter among the disciples. And I think that's important for us today because many still doubt today. And many of you, before you were saved, before you came to know Jesus, you doubted in some way, shape, or form. Doubt is a part of the journey, and many times it takes a moment for our doubts to be taken away and for us to come to a place of faith. But Thomas, again, had missed the moment. He missed it. I think the big idea for us today is a simple one. Don't miss the master, even if you missed the moment. Don't miss the master, even if you miss the moment. I want you to notice a few things about how the disciples interact with Thomas one-on-one. And then I want you to see how Jesus interacted with Thomas one-on-one today. The first thing I want you to notice is this. The disciples noticed Thomas. I think that's important. I think it's significant. In John 20, verse 24, it says, But Thomas, called twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. They noticed that he missed the moment. They noticed that he wasn't there. They noticed Thomas was missing. Have you ever felt like nobody noticed you? Have you ever felt like you didn't matter? Have you ever felt like you were invisible? Have you ever felt like if if you disappeared today, nobody would care and nobody would notice? If you've ever felt like that, you know it's a terrible feeling, isn't it? It's a terrible feeling to not be noticed. It's a terrible feeling to feel like nobody cares. It's a terrible feeling to feel like you're invisible or if you were gone, nobody would care and nobody would notice. I've felt that way. Everybody I know has felt that way at some point in our life, and you know how awful that is. Maybe you feel that way right now. Maybe you felt that way this week. Maybe you feel that way in your marriage. Maybe you feel that way in your, at your work, at your job. Maybe you feel that way right here in this big crowd of people at church. Thomas didn't know that feeling, at least not in this case, not in this scenario, because you know what the disciples made sure he knew? They made sure that he knew he was noticed. They made sure that he knew he was missed. It's why they specifically mention the fact that Thomas, for some unknown reason, was not there, that he missed the moment when Jesus appeared to them. They noticed his absence. They missed his presence. They make mention of this fact because Thomas is an important part of their group. He's a part of the 12. It even says that in the text. He missed it, but they still noticed him. 
Can I ask you a question? You don't have to answer this one out loud. No raising hands or anything on this one. But who do you know right now, this very hour today, who do you know that's not here this morning? Who do you know that's not in any church this morning? Have you noticed them? There are billions of people all over the world right now that are not in or connected to any church right now at this very moment. And when I say church, I, I mean, I don't mean like a building. I don't mean an organization. I don't mean a, a nonprofit. I don't mean an institution. I mean the church, the people of God. You and I. There are billions of people today that will go unnoticed around the world by us. There are millions of people right here in our own country that go unnoticed by the church every single day. We shop with them. We do recreation with them. We live beside them. We work with them. We're friends with them. But we don't even seem to notice that they're not here. There are tens of thousands of people right here in our own county that we don't notice. People all over the place that that just go unnoticed. People that we call friends, people that we say are family, but we don't even notice. And the truth is, they're not noticed by any other congregations either. Sometimes I think it's, it's, it's so easy as believers to get so focused on living for Jesus and following Jesus and being who Jesus has called us to be that we forget about those Jesus came to save. We forget about the very people Jesus came to redeem. He came to redeem those who were forgotten, those who were lost, those who nobody else noticed, those who nobody else would touch, those who nobody else would love, those who nobody else would speak to, those who nobody else would dine with. He noticed them all. I think the question for us is, do we? Because there are lots and lots and lots of people in your world right now, your world, your circle, your world, my world right now, who would love to be noticed by you. They would love to be invited to church. They would love to be invited to your small group. They would love to be invited to dinner. They would just love to know they were missed and they were noticed. I'm not saying they'll come to church with you next week. I'm not saying they'll join your small group. I bet they'll come to dinner, but they, they may not come to everything you invite them to. But I do know this. If, if they know you notice them and if they know you matter to them enough to take that chance and take that risk and invite them, it'll make an impact on their life. They will love that you noticed. I promise you, just knowing that somebody notices you can make all the difference in the world. I think it's great that the disciples noticed Thomas, noticed that he had missed the moment with Jesus, but they didn't want him to miss the master altogether. So they didn't just notice him. The second thing they did was this. They told him. They told him. They noticed him, and then they told him. Thomas had missed the moment, but they don't want him to miss the master. So they told him what had happened in the moment that he missed. Verse 25, so the other disciples were telling him, they were telling him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, if I don't see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger into the mark of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will never believe. They didn't just notice that Thomas wasn't there. They didn't just notice that he missed the moment. They helped inform him of what happened and what he missed. They wanted to fill him in on what the moment was because they don't want him to miss the master. That's why they said, we have seen the Lord. That's what they told him. We've seen the Lord. Yeah, he, yeah, he died on the cross. Yeah, he was in the tomb, but you know it was empty. And then he showed up in the room with us, man. You missed it. But that's what happened. <laughs> Thomas still didn't believe it. But at least they noticed him and at least they told him. As disciples, we're supposed to be telling people about Jesus. We're supposed to be telling people about the moments we have with Jesus. 
Noticing them is great, but if we never tell them, then we've fallen short of what we're supposed to do as believers. In Mark chapter 16, Jesus said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation, and whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. We're supposed to go and tell, aren't we? Jesus always intended to send his disciples into the world to tell others the good news. In fact, if you read John's account of this event and you back up to verse 21 where Jesus showed up while Thomas was gone, the moment that he missed, it actually says this. Jesus says, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also, what? Send you. You're supposed to go tell people about this moment and every other moment we've had together. He was sending them out to tell others what they had seen and what they had heard. Now, I know there are many Christians in the world today who are overwhelmed and overworked and, of course, underpaid. We all are. But I know there are many Christians who are overwhelmed and overworked and they're discouraged and they're afraid and they don't feel like they've been trained and they're confused and maybe a little conflicted on... On, on should they get into other people's business and should they tell them things of this nature and all of that. And I know it seems really complicated to a, a lot of people. And then you got people like me, these preachers who get up there and are always telling you to go out and share the gospel, go out and be an evangelist, go out there and proclaim the good news to the world and bring sinners to a point of repentance and bring them to the cross and all of those good things, and you're sitting there, I know, you're sitting there, and you're thinking, well, that sounds good, but I, I, that's not me, I don't know how to do that. You know, I think sometimes we just make it too complicated, we try to make it sound too fancy. It, it really isn't hard, y'all. You know what you're supposed to do as a believer? You know what telling people about Jesus really is? It's not memorizing the book of Romans, It's not memorizing the Romans road. It's not learning some fancy evangelism cube or bridge method. The truth is all you need to do to tell people you notice and love about Jesus is tell them what you've seen and heard. That's it. All all you need to do is tell them about the moments you've had with Jesus. The moments they've missed. The moments that have transformed your life. Tell them about the way you got saved. Tell them about what you're learning in your Bible. Tell tell them about what he's speaking in your life. Tell tell them about the prayers he's answered. Like, all you have to do is tell them what Jesus has done. That's exactly what the disciples did. They just told Thomas what they had seen and heard, what they had experienced. They told him about the moment he had missed. You You don't have to preach like I'm preaching right now. You don't even have to have your Bible with you. All you have to do, though, is just tell people the the real truth of what Jesus has done for you. This is the way Paul put it in Romans 10, 14 through 17. He said, how then can they call on him they have not believed in? And how can they believe without hearing about him? In other words, if nobody tells them, how are they going to ever know? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? So faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the message about Christ. Not everybody's going to believe you. Thomas didn't believe his friends. He didn't believe these guys he had traveled with. He he didn't believe them. Not everybody's going to believe you either, but that's okay. You still tell them. You still tell them about the moments you've had. You still tell them about what God's done in your life. Because how can people believe if you never tell them? How will they ever hear if you never tell them? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Man, I hope we'll be a church full of people with a lot of pretty feet. Not, that, not those kind of feet, these kind of feet. Because I hope we're a church that notices people, and I hope we're a church that tells people. I think it's great that the disciples told Thomas about what had happened. And I think it'd be great if we would all tell somebody this week that we notice. 
as well. Just because they missed the life-changing moment you had, just because they missed the life-changing moment that happened in your life doesn't mean they have to miss the master altogether. Just because you miss a moment doesn't mean you have to miss the master. That is, if you'll take the time to notice and take the time to tell. And then there's this third thing that the disciples do, and this is a big one. They welcomed him. They welcomed him. I want you to notice verse 26. It says, a week later, a week later, y'all, we fast forward a whole week. A week later, his disciples were indoors again, and Thomas was with them. And even though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. A week later... And Thomas is still with them. Thomas has suffered in his unbelief for an entire week. Now, now keep in mind, the first time Jesus showed up, he came in when the doors were locked. Everybody was freaked out. He talks to them. He eats with them. They get to touch him. They get to sit around with him. Like, that's, this is probably something they talked about throughout the week, don't you think? Like, this probably isn't something you mention one time to Thomas and one time to each other and then you kind of forgot about it as the days went on. You know all week long they've been sitting around. I mean, we don't have a record of this, but you know all week long they've been talking about what happened the last week. Man, you remember what he said? Gosh, I got to hug him. I got to sit by him. Man, when I put my finger in there and came out, it was all bloody and stuff. I was like, whoa, that freaked me out. And Thomas the whole time is like, man, y'all are crazy. Y'all out of your mind. I mean, he thinks they just had a little bit too much wine to drink when he was gone. He thinks maybe they got into the wrong kind of mushrooms or something like he, but he has not believed it. And yet he is still with them for an entire week. They've been talking about it for an entire week. He's been denying it, but he's still there with them. He's still welcomed by them. He's still at the table with them. He's still in the room with them. He's still hanging out with them. He's still eating with them. I mean, think about how easy it would have been for all the other disciples to gang up on Thomas and say, man, if you're not going to believe us, just get out of here. We, we've been telling you about this for five days. Like, we're all, we were all here. We all saw it, Thomas. And Tom, if you don't trust us, buddy, you can, there's the door, man. Go ahead and leave. Go find you another group. Like, you should believe us, man. We're your brothers. We've been through a lot together. How frustrating this must have been for these disciples who had seen it, who had been there, who had witnessed the moment that Thomas had missed. And how hard it must have been for Thomas to be on the outside and to be the only one who didn't see it, the one who had missed it. And I wonder why they didn't kick him out. I wonder why they didn't get frustrated with him. I wondered why they they didn't show him the door. You want to know why? I think it's because the disciples all realized what they were asking Thomas to believe. This is hard to believe. The man you saw die on a cross, get put in a tomb, is alive. He came in, though the door was locked. We touched him. He had wounds. I think they all remembered the, the doubt they had in their own heart when they thought he was a ghost. And the fact that they hadn't been able to believe it themselves until they had touched him. And so they, they sympathized with Thomas. And they were like, you know, listen, I know this is hard to believe. But they just kept telling him. They kept noticing him. They kept staying close to him. I think they remembered when they had had their own doubts. When they had been confused and conflicted and unsure. Before they had actually seen Jesus themselves. And you know what this made me think? It makes me wonder and it makes me think. If we as Christians, if we as believers today are way too quick to dismiss people who don't believe for one reason or another. Because to us, we've had the moment. To us, we've had that experience. We've heard Jesus call our name. We've given our lives to him. We know our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. To us, when we open God's word, he speaks to us. To us, when, when we pray, we feel his presence. To us, we've seen prayers answered and then we're out there trying to tell other people who are non-believers who have been blinded by the devil and blinded by this world and they're struggling to understand what we're trying to communicate they're confused by it they're conflicted by it they're they're unsure about Jesus because like Thomas they've never had their moment 
And I think it's easy for us to forget what it was like to be Thomas. I was thinking about it this week. I was thinking about the friends who came to me when I was young before I was saved who were telling me about this Jesus guy who died on a cross and rose from the dead and all this. I'm like, that's unbelievable. And then they're telling me I can just give him my sins and he'll take them and he'll wash me clean by the blood of the lamb. That sounds kind of nasty, but still sounds too good to be true, right? Like, he's going to do that for free? Nobody does nothing for free for you. That sounds way too good to be true. And if it's too good to be true, then it probably is. They were telling me all about the truth of the cross and this moment that they had had, but I had never had it. And it was hard to believe. I mean, it really is indescribable. It's hard to understand, isn't it? 2 Corinthians 9.15, Paul, he even says, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. It's undescribable. But see, that's easy to forget once you've had the moment. It's easy to forget when you have seen it with your own eyes and heard it with your own ears and felt it and experienced it in your own heart. It's easy to forget it once the truth of the gospel is implanted in you and you're sealed up with the Holy Spirit and He's living inside of you and speaking to you, which is why it's so easy to just quickly dismiss people who don't pay attention to you when you try to tell it to them. Which is exactly why I find it amazing that the disciples didn't just dismiss Thomas, but rather they continued to welcome him and accept him and tell him even though he remained in his unbelief. They cared about Thomas. They noticed that he was missed. They noticed he missed an incredible moment. And so they were patient with him because they didn't want him to miss the master. They noticed him, they told him, and they welcomed him. And here in our text, we turn and we... See, Jesus have a one-on-one time with Thomas now. And I want you to see what Jesus does. Jesus does three things with Thomas. The first thing he does, the next point in your bulletin is this. He notices him. That's the very first thing. Jesus comes into the room. He says, hey, hey guys, peace to everybody. And then he said to Thomas. The very first thing Jesus does is he turns to Thomas. He doesn't pretend that Thomas is not there. He doesn't dismiss Thomas. He knows Thomas hasn't believed all week long. He knows Thomas hasn't hasn't given the testimony of the others, the, the, the clout it probably should have had. He knows Thomas is the one in the room who's not believing anything, but still he notices him. He doesn't pretend he's not there. He doesn't ignore him. He he doesn't go to the people that have so-called more faith. No, he turns to Thomas and he says, hey, buddy. He's the very first one to get recognized. He calls him by name. He acknowledges his presence. He expresses that Thomas is valuable. And he's worth recognizing by name. even though Thomas hasn't believed. Jesus knew that Thomas had missed the moment, but he didn't want him to miss the master. So he notices him. And I tell you again, just because you've missed the moment doesn't mean you have to miss the master, because Jesus still this day notices you and knows you by name. What does Jesus do next? Verse 27, he told him, Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Jesus gives Thomas the opportunity everybody else had already had. He gives him the opportunity to examine the evidence, to see for himself. Jesus told him, bring your big finger over here and put it right here. You want to put your hand inside my belly? Go ahead. Reach on in there. Fill around. Do whatever you need to do, man. You're going to get the same opportunity everybody else. Come and examine the evidence. You want to touch me? Touch me. You want to hug me? Hug me. You want to talk to me? Talk to me. I'm here. You're important. You're valued. Now come over here and examine the evidence. I want you to be convinced that I'm real. Come and examine the evidence so you know that the gospel is real. 
Come and examine the evidence so all of your doubts and all of your fears once and for all can be put away and put aside and be done with so we can get on with the mission I have for your life. He says, touch my flesh, take a look. I'm real. The resurrection is real. The gospel is real. This is real. I'm glad you're here for this moment, Tom. And then the third thing he does, he welcomed him. He welcomes him into the kingdom of God. He welcomes him into belief. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, look at my hands, reach out your hand, put it into my side. And he says, don't be faithless, but believe. He welcomes him into belief. Jesus invites Thomas to believe. He invites Thomas to join the others in their belief. He says, don't continue in your unbelief anymore. Believe in me. Believe in the gospel. Believe in the resurrection. And Thomas does. It says in verse 28, Thomas responded to him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus says, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Jesus noticed him, Jesus told him, and Jesus welcomed him. This is really encouraging to me on two levels. First, it's encouraging to see that the disciples actually got it right. (laughs) It's encouraging to see that the disciples are acting like they should. They're acting like Jesus. Because let's be honest, these knuckleheads don't act like Jesus most of the time. But it's encouraging. I mean, you can almost like feel and see that they're Faith is growing. Their spiritual maturity is taking root. How good it must have felt to Jesus to see these guys all week long, noticing Thomas, telling Thomas, and continuing to welcome Thomas. It's a great testament to their faith. It's a great testament to their spiritual maturity. And it's a great testament to the power of the gospel. It's a great testament to the fact that you can fail a whole bunch like they had, and you can still keep trying and eventually get it right. It's also encouraging for a second reason. It's encouraging because from his interaction with Jesus, we can see from Thomas that you're never too far gone. You're never too lost. You can never be too lonely to be noticed by, told by, and welcomed by Jesus. That's good news, isn't it? It's encouraging news. It's welcome news for us today to know that no matter where we've been or what we've done or who we've done it with or how long it's been or how, much, how deep-rooted our unbelief has been, how insistent we've been in our unbelief, that Jesus still notices us, tells us, and welcomes us. There are two challenges here in this text for two different groups of people. The first is for those of us who have believed, those of us who have had our moment, those of us who have given our lives to Christ, those who have seen and heard with our own eyes and ears, those who have experienced with our own hearts, those who have been washed by the blood of the Lamb and have the Holy Spirit in their life. The challenge for you and I this week, if you're in that group, is this, that we would reflect the character of Christ, just like the disciples did, that we would go out and we would notice people, we would tell people, and we would welcome people, even people who don't believe, especially people who don't believe. For the other group of people in the room, for those who have not believed, for those who have missed the moment, and for whatever reason, there's a variety of reasons why maybe you haven't believed, the challenge for you today is the same one Christ gave to Thomas. Because just like Thomas, you too have missed your moment, apparently. And to him, Jesus said, do not continue in your unbelief, but believe. Believe. Thomas chose to believe. The question is, will you? My message to you this morning is this. You don't have to miss the master. You don't have to miss the master today. Because today can be the moment that you have your moment with Jesus. Don't miss the moment. He notices you. He loves you. He doesn't just know your name. He knows the number of hairs on your head. He knows every thought in your heart. 
He knows everything about you and he still loves you. Don't miss the fact that he's told you time and time again, not just through this sorry preaching you've heard today, but he's told you through friends and family. He's told you through answered prayer requests. He's told you in the middle of the night. He's told you through the sunrise and the sunset. He's told you through the whisper of the wind. He has told you over and over again. You can't look at the stars in the sky and not see that he has told you that he's real. He's told you and told you and told you because he notices you. Don't miss the moment because he will welcome you into the kingdom of God. Make you an heir to the kingdom of God. Give you an inheritance that will never perish, spoil, or fade away. One that moths and rust can't destroy. He will adopt you as a son or a daughter in his kingdom. Oh yeah, he notices you. Oh yeah, he's told you. And oh yeah, he is ready to welcome you and write your name in the Lamb's book of life. So eternity will be yours. Don't miss the moment. Don't miss the master. Let's pray. that's you and you're here today and have never given your life to Christ, if you can hear my voice and have never given your life to Christ, we invite you to pray with us. Simply say this, Lord, it's me. I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I've gone astray. I know that I've messed things up. I know that I've missed the moment. But today, I don't want to miss the Master. I know that you're real. I know that you died for me. I know that you have the power to forgive me. So I ask that you would. In faith, I ask that you would forgive me of my sins and give me the great gift of eternal life. Make me new. Cleanse me. I thank you for your grace and for your goodness, for your love and for your mercy. Thank you for dying for me. Father, we thank you for those who have just called on you for the first time as their Lord and Savior. We thank you that finally they didn't miss the moment and especially that they didn't miss the master. Lord, help us this week to be a people who notice, who tell, and who welcome. Not because it's the right thing to do, Lord. No, it's not just the right thing to do. It's the thing you want us to do. It's the model you set for us. Help us to be people like the disciples were to Thomas, to our friends and family and strangers. Help us to be as patient and long-suffering and as willing to welcome and tell and notice as you were to Thomas and every other sinner that's ever walked the face of this planet. Lord, help us to be like you. That's our prayer. And Lord, we would be remiss to close today without saying thank you for noticing us, for dying for us, and for giving each of us a moment with you. In Jesus' name we pray.